On today's Retro Tech Repair, we're going to be trying to rescue this Sony boombox that I bought spares or repair on eBay. So let's go ahead and get this unboxed. It's in a three wheel light up scooter box, but obviously that isn't what it is. Now, I don't know if there's anything special about this boom box. It's just that, well, I've done a lot of things on the channel, which, well, I thought were interesting. But honestly, interesting can be a little bit expensive sometimes. So I thought, you know what, I'm gonna see what I can do for a pound. Now, of course, I had shipping to pay on this, so has it been a lot more than actually a pound, but uh, we'll see. And as you'll see from the eBay listing, I didn't even have to pay a pound. I paid 49 pence, but I also had three pounds 99 shipping to pay. And that was just the start of my problems. Oh boy, is this in bad condition. This is in actually worse condition than I imagined. Yeah, just awful. Absolutely awful. This is going to be quite the restoration job. If we can make this go at all, I'm gonna be surprised. Very, very, very bad. Okay, well, let's see. Obviously extremely dirty. It's got, looks like some mold or something growing on there. Obviously being kept in a shed. The aerial has completely gone off the back there. The aerial tab is missing. The whole thing is absolutely filthy. Uh, the speaker grills have gone rusty, although in fairness, they at least are not dented. Uh, and the whole thing is covered in scratches. Looks like the LCD may be intact. The buttons seem to function. Uh, see if the cassette works at all. Yeah, uh, cassette opens and uh, cassette mechanism does not play. Interesting. Well, the cassette doesn't move, so it feels like this might be a elect. Oh no, hang on, there it is. Uh, I think probably the next thing to do is to kind of get this taken apart and, and cleaned up. It looks like it's had uh, some kind of pat testing or appliance ID on it. Maybe it's been on a job site. It certainly looks like that could have been the case. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of work, this. Let's get tearing into this and see what we can do. Really got a lot of pressure on now. Easier. I'm going to make it. I don't think the screw is going to be recoverable, but uh, that's okay. Uh, did have some thread lock on it by the looks of it. We lost the screw head, of course, but uh, we'll find something else to go back in there. Now we can take the antenna out. Nice. Feel like we're made to start. All right, so uh, carrying with the plastics. It's like I've uh, got three of the four screws out. Another one in there somewhere. No, no. There we go. seems to lift out. I see some screws holding the cassette neck, but don't see anything in there that's holding it together. All right. Okay, so um, yeah, it's really dirty in here. Uh, but the two parts uh, do come to pieces. Looks like there is some connections you can see in there or not. So we're gonna try and separate those connectors. This has a certain smell about it and it's, it's not a good one. 
Okay, we are getting there. Now you can see what's going on. Speakers look to be intact at least. And it seems to be fairly modular in its design, which is good. All right, okay, well, this is the front part. So maybe we'll see if we can get parts taken off of this in order that we can give this a thorough clean and then we'll turn our attentions to the rest of this later. Quite a few people have asked me, why don't you do more radios or cassette players or Walkmans? And the short answer is because I'm not very good at them. Really, I'm not. Well, I'm not very good at a lot of what I do, but I'm particularly not very good at kind of boom boxes and the like. I can't imagine there's a great audio response from this little speaker either. I'll work out how these grills are fastened to the front plastics here. And they may be molded in. Yeah, I don't see these coming out easily. I think we might have to clean those up and maybe even paint them in situ. We'll see. Uh, let's get this printed circuit assembly out here. Our printed circuit assembly just lifts out. Which is good. Hopefully we'll get that cleaned up. I'm hoping that works. I really don't want to have to fuss with this too much. Yeah, I think that's just kind of double-sided tape on that. So we'll need to find something to replace that with too. And I think that might be it. Oh, one last part. Okay, good. Well, that's something. We can go and get this cleaned up now, hopefully. All right, let's move on to the back. All right, well, start with the easy bits. There's a printed circuit assembly here that looks like it will unplug. I am quite impressed with how modular this is. There is a some kind of mechanical connection there by the looks of it, but I'm probably not going to see what that is until I have this all in pieces. There's something going on the front of that board to do with the radio. Okay, maybe not. So we'll do a quick close up of the printed circuit board. It doesn't really mean anything to me. Analog electronics really aren't my area of expertise, but there is the printed circuit board. Cassette mat looks extremely grimy. There's a lot of plastic involved. It's hard to tell by looking at it whether or not it's going to function, of course. But I really do not want to get involved in stripping it down. Okay, so here's our cassette mech. Again, doesn't mean anything to me, but uh, there it is. I Looks like actually this is a permanent magnet uh, erase head, which is a bit of a shame, but there again, obviously this is a cassette mech on a budget. This was never a high-end device. Has one belt on it, that belt or two in fact. Well, it won't be easy to replace those, but presumably it's possible to replace those and probably we should look to do that, but uh, that's free, okay. Power board. Connections for the battery are pretty much melted to the front there. Really strange. There's a, a slider on the back for AM, FM selection. But what that's doing is just flicking a slider switch on the printed circuit board there. Again, a rocker switch. Looks like that might slide out of the way. I'm not quite sure how that would come out. I guess when the printed circuit assembly comes out, that will come with it, but these knobs need to come off. So we'll prise those out of the way. Yeah, they seem to want to come. A bit more plaster dust under here. So I'm starting to think a plasterer's radio. Never buy a plasterer's radio, huh? not a good thing.
All right, that's the main board out again, not in, uh, in fantastic condition at all, really cruddy and uh, full of dirt and debris, really not very nice at all. So these screws are holding the transformer in, but I think then they're holding that and the printer circuit board to the plastics. That's one of them. We'll get to that in a minute. And the other one's tucked right away down here. Just bend that plastic out of the way to get to it. And how about that? Here is our power board with its fuse. And we'll test that. Uh, it looks visually to be okay, but we'll double check that. Cool. And that's the last of our screws. So uh, there's the teardown. I don't think I'm gonna try and extract these uh, metal conducting pieces from here. We're gonna leave those in the plastic. As for the back enclosure, the handle, will the handle come out easily? No, I don't think it's going to. I think trying to get the handle out is gonna be just a, a stretch too far. So maybe this goes in the shower now. So I actually cleaned up the parts with washing up liquid and a brush in the kitchen sink and they turned out pretty well. The water helped dissolve a lot of the plaster dust that was accumulated on them. They're still scruffy and scratched, but they're not too bad. One thing that really needs attention though are the grills. These are permanently molded into the front enclosure and have gone rusty, so I'm going to sand them back with some sandpaper. So obviously I'm going to have to do something with this grill. Now I've sanded it, it looks quite a mess. I can't remove it from the plastics. It's kind of over molded into this injection molded front piece here. So there's nothing I can do to separate it. I uh, probably gonna have to paint it. And if I paint this one, well, I'm gonna have to paint this one too. And if I'm going to paint it, then I'm going to need to mask it off. Well, that took a while. So now we have the speaker grills masked off. I'm going to mask off the rest of the front of the boom box with a newspaper, in fact, a copy of the Scarborough News. And now we've got that done, I'm going to paint these grills with some black paint. So here it is, I had to hurriedly paint it actually because the rain was coming in, uh, so there are a few spots that aren't perfect, but uh, that's the way it goes. I had to do it when I could, uh, actually in the backyard of the apartment building I'm in, so I didn't have a lot of time to spend on it, but you will see how it looks when we get it unwrapped. You know what, that could be a lot worse. I was debating whether to use the gloss or the satin for the black, and definitely the satin was the way to go. It's got a nice sheen to it. You know what, that's, that's really not that bad. Now I need to clean off the rest of the plastics here, um, I tried various things for this. Uh, at first I tried kind of a furniture polish, like a, you know, Mr. Sheen aerosol polish, and, and that didn't clean up too well really. It created a kind of a shiny look. And so then I went to some car care products and trying to kind of tea cut color restorer. And the problem with that was that kind of left a bit of a shiny finish too, and I didn't really care for it. So I think I'm just going to gently go over this with a magic eraser and just kind of take some of the uh, maybe sheen off and leave it a little bit more matte. I, I think that's the look I'm gonna prefer and maybe that'll mask just a few more of the marks that are in here. And again, I would say it's not bad. It's not perfect, it's never going to be, but it's not shocking. I'm quite liking the way this is stacking up. So I think now we can finally put the speakers in this and I've been trying to keep them safe. Unfortunately, I can't remember which way round they went, uh, but we'll figure that out, I'm sure. So this is the orientation I've gone for. It keeps the connectors down to the bottom so I can run this under the cable guide there and it keeps this connector on the correct side for when I reassemble everything. So I think this is the right way. Hopefully it is, if not, well, I'll press I'll have to switch these around. But for now, this is what I'm going with. At least the speakers will be protected while everything else is going on. So while we're working on the front cover, I think I'm going to slide the tuner module back in. Uh, one of the things that attracted me to this particular radio, well, really it was 99 pence, but uh, I did think it was quite nice that it had a digital tuner, very much of the age, I think that was seen as a step forward, maybe a step up 
from a conventional dial. From my perspective, it doesn't have a dial cord. I really don't have any luck with dial cords when I'm trying to adjust those. So that is the piece of string, if you like, that moves the pointer along when you turn the knob, the tuning knob, that's the dial cord. I don't have any success with those. So I was quite pleased to see this digital tuner. Anyway, let's slide it back in. All right, now the front panel that goes over this was kind of glued in place with some double-sided tape. So I've bought some double-sided tape to replace that with. I'll have to cut that to shape. There's a few marks, unfortunately, on the plastic there that I don't think are going to polish out, at least not without losing the transfer, which I don't really want to do. So we we'll just have to live with those. So let's take a look at this cassette mech. And you know, it's a little disappointing for Sony, but perhaps indicative of the era. This is why I think we remember cassettes so unfavorably because by the mid nineties, CD was becoming a much more popular format. And so a lot less attention I think was being applied to cassette decks. And if you have a nice quality cassette deck from late in the evolution of that format, they're actually really nice things. Whereas uh, the lower end stuff like this was really built down to a budget. And I'm afraid that shows we have a permanent magnet erase head here. Uh, the materials are all very cheap and flimsy, but it does seem to be holding together, which for me is great because I'm not great at restoring or repairing these mechanical parts. Uh, the belts, one is intact, sort of, the other is extremely loose and perished. So we'll get those changed out next. All right, so the motor does still turn, which is great. Hopefully then it's going to work. It doesn't look like there's been an awful lot of use on this, but uh, yeah, it's still, still evident that it has been used. Here is our belt. It's lost quite a lot of its springiness. So I'm gonna see if I have one that matches that or comes pretty close to it. So there's another belt here on the lower of the reels. I'm gonna take that off too, because I really want to give these kind of uh, Rollers, another word right? I don't know. I don't know what you call them really. A bit of a clean too. So here are my random belt selection. Now oh, well, it's not that random. It's whatever was in the selection of belts that I bought from Amazon. So, or maybe eBay. I need to try and find something that's about the right size. And as you can see, they're not particularly well organized. So I think basically there are three sizes of belts in this kind of random selection that I have. One belt is just a little bit too large. It looks like it should fit, but it isn't. So I've had to go for the smaller one. I'm hoping that's not going to put too much tension and stop us being able to work this cassette deck, but I'm gonna try it anyway. All right, so unfortunately the camera went out there, the battery ran out, but I've managed to get the kind of medium sized belt on here. Smaller than the two that were originally in, they could have stretched a little. It does feel a little taut, but I'm hoping that that's going to be enough. So we're gonna reassemble that now and see how it goes. So we'll have to see how the motor copes with the high attention from these belts, because these belts are smaller than the ones that were originally in there. I'll keep the original ones just in case I need to remeasure them and buy some from somewhere else. So now I need to assemble the plastic buttons back onto the cassette mech, but fortunately I'd had the foresight to take a photograph of that beforehand so I can see which ones go where. And so now with reference to the photograph that I took earlier, let's get this cassette mech reassembled and the buttons in the correct orientation. Looks like this was the way it was when I took the photo, so we'll reassemble it on that basis. Now there are still a few little bits and pieces of kind of plaster or something stuck in there. So I'm gonna get this cleaned off with a toothbrush before we reassemble this. So whilst I have the Windex out, I'm gonna use it to clean the pinch roller here. Now the pinch roller, when I had these cassette 
decks back in the day, this type of thing, I'd always clean those with isopropanol alcohol, but I'm not convinced that's the best thing to do. So we're gonna try a little Windex first, a little bit of something soapy, and we'll see if that cleans it up. And I am going to use just a little IPA to clean up the cassette head, or the play head, because the erase head is a magnet, and, uh, and also the, uh, whatever this kind of capstan, is it? I don't know what that's called really. There's close to no residue coming off this. My suspicion is this cassette deck actually hasn't been used very much. All right, so that being uh, that, I think it's time to get it back into the enclosure. So I may have thought it was time to get it back into the enclosure, but it's not. There's a few other things to do first. So now it's time to reinstall some parts in the back and I'm going to start off with the antenna. Now this is the antenna that I got with it, so clearly I can't do anything with that. What I did was I bought a pack of assorted antennas off Amazon, but unfortunately they are smaller in diameter than the one that was in there originally, so there is going to be a bit of a space kind of flopping around in there, but I'm hoping I can get away with it. Now I suppose I could have bought an original Sony antenna, but the cost was prohibitive and I just don't think it was worth it for this particular boombox. But unfortunately the narrow diameter antennas that I got for replacement did leave things a bit wobbly. Mm, not, I'm not blown away with that. So I ended up wrapping some electrical tape around the bottom chrome piece of the antenna in order to increase its diameter. It's not perfect, but it worked quite well, and I still have good conductivity to the brass section via the screw. And when it's assembled, the screw should hold the brass section to the contact on the RF board. Well, that's not perfect, but honestly, it's better than I feared I might get, so I'm, uh, I'm gonna stick with that. So next up is the RF board. I haven't really done anything with this. I just brushed the dust off it. No good can come of turning any of these pots or tuners, in my opinion. So let me see how this is oriented in there. Looks like maybe it goes in this way around. So let's, uh, let's try that. Looks good. So we're going to do the power board next at this side. So there are a couple of things I want to check on the power board before we put it back in. And the first one is this fuse here. So I have my meter on continuity check and we'll just go across the fuse contacts and that shows continuity, which is good. And then the second thing, there is a switch in here, which when you insert the power cord, uh, kind of disconnects the battery. So I just want to make sure that that is correct as well. So I think these are the pins for it here. At the moment it's showing open. I don't know whether that's right or not. So let's put a power cord in and see if it changes. Obviously this, Nothing on the end of the power cord is disconnected. This is just to check if that switch is working or not. Yeah, and it's still open, which was my fear. So I do think that we probably need to try and clean up this switch somehow. I'm just gonna try and squirt some kind of contact cleaner in from every angle and see if I can get down into that. Well, I'm not convinced, but let's try it. We'll work the switch back and forwards a few times. So now after some treatment with our contact cleaner here, when I go in with the meter on continuity, let's just position that better. I can see that when there is no power connector in there, we do have good continuity across these two pins. And then when I insert the power cord, that switch is pressed and there is nothing there. So I think this is ready to go back in too. Okay, so the next board we're going to be looking at is the amplifier board. It has on it an amplifier chip, TA. 8229K, I think that's a five watt amplifier when I looked it up, so that gives you some idea of what the amplification capabilities of this boom box are. There's a few things I'm going to clean up on here. Some corrosion that's apparent behind the heatsink here, tucked away. I'm gonna try and get to that with some IPA because I really don't want to have to unsolder everything. 
I'm going to clean the switches on here with some contact cleaner and also the earphone jack. So let's get the desk covered and we'll get on with that. And as it's drying off, we'll try and get it back into the main enclosure here. Probably would have been a bit easier had I put the power board in separately, but well, you know, it's already in now, so I'm just going to try and work around it. And now we can put the knobs back on too. Nice. And now finally, we can get the cassette mechanism in. There we are. And I think that might be it for the back now. I think most of the work now is on the front and then we'll bring the two halves back together. So we have a few things left to do on our front enclosure here. I need to reroute the cables through the cable management. I think there's a little clamp I need to put on here as well. There's the roller for the cassette door and also the spring. So I'm gonna go ahead and get that done. So our little boom box is starting to look quite nice now, but does it work? Well, unfortunately, I don't have a great place to test it. My apartment's in an old stone building with big thick walls, and there's a lot of electrical equipment around, but we'll give it a go. And here we run into a problem. The radio worked just fine, but when I recorded the footage, I recorded something that would get me a copyright strike if I was going to put it on YouTube. The radio is now gone, and I can't show you it working. Loads to my husband, Jack. Maybe we'll have more luck with the tape. So I have a brand new cassette here. I don't have any pre-recorded ones that don't have video games on them, so uh, we're just gonna have to put a blank one in and, and see how that does. Yes, you've guessed it, I did it again. I've recorded the video of a repair and I can't show you what I repaired working. Even going through all of my video footage, the best that I could find was a recording of a single tone using the internal microphone. The internal microphone really doesn't do the boom box justice, and worse still, it was just interfered with by my mobile phone. <laughs> So what do we think? Well, you know, it's not perfect, but I think it looks a lot better than it did before. And if I'm not going to save it, then who is? It probably wasn't worth the effort, but nonetheless, it is a little piece of retro that if we hadn't invested some time in it, would no longer be with us. And I think, you know, it's, it's an interesting exercise to see just what you can do for 99 pence, or actually in this case, I think 49 pence, certainly less than a pound on eBay. So before I leave you, I'm going to give you a summary of the financials on my 49p boombox. Well, with shipping, it cost me about £4.48. And if I'm generous, I probably spent about a pound on cleaning materials. The aerials cost me £18, although I do have some of those left over. And the paint and masking tape cost me about a tenner. By coincidence, £10 is about what I got for it on eBay when I sold it. That was including me shipping it to the seller and it cost me about £8 to ship and then I had eBay fees on top of it. So as a rough estimate, I'd say that I lost approximately £35. Oh, and I had to throw in a power lead because it didn't come with one. But that just about wraps it up for our boombox today. I hope you've enjoyed the video and if you have, you'll leave comments and consider hitting subscribe. But until next time, I'd just like to thank you so much for watching Retrotech Repair. <laughs> Oops. And, back. and off we come with the lid.